that time, I don't remember, about a young woman who after 20 some years had almost by accident found the killer of her mother. And I thought, what an incredible thing. She had been looking, but not obsessively, but it happened. And the story was very brief in the paper, but I took that as a cue and tried to imagine what that would be like. And the title is, of course, you see him now. She was haunted. She was five years old when, when her mother was shot. And she had a some very blurry mental image of the killer. And finally, she was able to track the killer down. So that was a, it was a mystery with romance in it too. Nothing, nothing too gory or too sexy. But the second book, and I'm going to share that with you, um, is called Fugo, F-U-G-O. And this was partly because my husband and I were taking a road trip somewhere, as we often did, and we were talking about the fact that all the then popular books were about war and so forth were about very high-tech airplanes and things like that. And my husband said, you know, nobody ever stops to think, what can we still do with low-tech? And he said, for instance, balloons. Now, my husband's an aerospace engineer, distinguished career at NASA and then in private industry. And I said, well, what are you thinking about? And he said, well, if you wrote a book about balloons dropping poisons, that would be kind of interesting. Well, that became Fugo. And Fugo, the title actually, is from a Japanese term that meant fire bombs. Because mm -hmm. during the Second World War, the Japanese actually built and launched very, they were thin paper balloons that were, they set out across the Pacific Ocean and they had incendiaries and so if they landed somewhere, and a few of them did on the west coast of the U.S., they could start fires. Well, there was no guidance system, no GPS, not even very low tech, and most of them fell into the ocean, but there, there was a fire that started in Oregon and uh, a family was having a picnic in their woods and uh, they were burned up. But because the program was not terribly successful as far as the Japanese were concerned, they, it was classified, but they stopped. And it wasn't known that they had this program for about 20 or 30 years after the war. So the concept that we worked on, and my husband contributed all the technical stuff, um, had to do with balloons. But in this book, they are heavily guided, and they're, they're high-tech balloons. But they are used to spread anthrax and cryptosporidium, so people don't get sick. And the idea is, that I never mention a country, but it's pretty clear that the, the really bad guys are from the Middle East. And this was at a time when the book was published that we had just uh, gotten rid of Osama bin Laden. He had just been found. So it was rather current at that time. And some of the technology now has been superseded, but there's nothing in the book that doesn't work, if you know what I mean. If you read it, you say, well, they can't do that, because they could do everything. Um, it's much longer than my other books, and it's, my husband always said, although he had the idea there were too many characters. <laughs> but I did start sending it to publishers, and I looked up publishers that would accept a book without an agent. And after a fair number of turndowns, I got a publisher in New Hampshire, of all places. He is a physicist, but he started his own publishing company. Mm -hmm. And it's called, it's called Diverter Press, D-I-E-E-R-T-I-R. At the point when he picked this book up, he had about maybe 10 books published. They tended to be on the science fiction, heavy on um, crime. This, of course, this is, I, I look at this as an international thriller. But he, he, he understood the technology, and so he thought it would be fun to work with. So I'm just going to read you two very short sections. Uh, the bad guys get figured out fairly early, except nobody knows where they're making the poisons, or where or where and how they're going to launch the balloon. So there are quite a few quite a few characters. A lot of it is set in Canada, where I haven't had the opportunity to travel when I was with NPR, and then subsequently, um, a lot of it is set in Vancouver. For those of you who've been there and enjoy it, I was always one of my favorite places. <laughs> anyway. Um, now we're going to see one of the good guys who works undercover. He's uh, ethnically Chinese. The day after Johnny met Ramin in the park, he became Ming Lu. Ming had a solid resume as a kitchen helper, but he was out of work. Just after noon on Friday, John rang the bell of a modest-looking building on Front Street that had a small plaque reading, Best Removal Company. He patted his right leg. He 
you felt good about the job interview to come. A tall, lanky man with black hair answered the bell after a few minutes. Yes, he glanced down at the short, oriental man with unusually broad shoulders. Johnny noticed no obvious bulge in Luke's clothing, no scabbard on his belt. Pardon me, sir, but I'm Ming Lu and it's my day off and I'm looking for work. I'm going to all the businesses in this neighborhood. I used to work in the kitchen at the Chan Palace two streets over, but they had to lay two of us off. Do you have anything? I can carry heavy loads. Look frowned. He did not appreciate this distraction, as he had to be prepared if Ramid showed up today. Look is one of the junior bad guys, and Ramid is the, his sectional boss. No, no, we have nothing. We are not hiring. Luke started to close the door. Ming looked down at his feet. Well, then may I ask a favor to use your bathroom for just a minute? I'm sorry, I've been out all morning and all this afternoon. Saying this, Ming inched a few steps into the doorway. This is not a public place, Luke answered harshly, looking up and down the street, worried that if Ramid came, that there would be complications. He looked square, squarely at the Chinaman or whatever he was and decided it might be better to let him in and get rid of him quickly. All right, the bathroom is just up there. Luck motioned into the dark hallway, but hurry up, I have work to do. He let Johnny in, closing the door behind him. Johnny took a few steps down the hall. When he heard Luck begin to follow him, he turned back swiftly, with his right hand already inside the highest pocket of his cargo pants. He pulled out the long, curved blade knife with one motion and aimed at Luck's neck. Luck did not cry out, but the look of surprise on his face gave Johnny much satisfaction as the knife sank into his skin. Luck collapsed on the ground. Johnny returned the knife to a heavy plastic pouch he carried in another pocket. He bent over Luck and retrieved a small ring of keys from Luck's side pocket. Johnny immediately went back to the front door and found the two, the two front door locks. Stepping back inside, he dialed a number on his cell phone. The cargo was ready for pickup, he said, and hung up. It was tempting to search the building but he suspected he would find little. He had his small revolver ready in his left pocket in case Luck had any friends on the premises, but he heard nothing. A final search of Luck's pockets extracted some loose pieces of paper, a wallet, and a cell phone. These Johnny dropped inside his ample side pockets. Then he reopened the front door, locked it, and checked the street. He moved quickly to the corner and walked the two blocks to his rendezvous with the minivan. When he saw it parked just behind a taxi stand, he went up to the driver's side. A middle-aged woman in a white uniform lowered the window. Johnny handed her the keys. In the lobby, he said, and kept on walking. The minivan pulled carefully into a thin stream of traffic. In a, in a few minutes, the two women medics entered a building on a side street in an industrial area and removed the body. They brought credentials in case anyone asked, and guns in case anyone interfered but they were able to accomplish their work uninterrupted. They chuckled at the best removal sign. We should have been the ones applying for jobs here, said Mrs. Diab, the shorter one. Her friend, one of U.S. military intelligence's best operatives for more than 25 years, smiled. It was all in a day's work. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you that in addition yeah, to the main area well, pretty well, one time when I was driving, as I usually do to Gloucester, they were repairing the road on 14. And these, these poor men, and they're always, almost always men, but not always, were holding the signs. And I thought, what a boring job. What a really, really, really boring job. And at that particular point, there weren't very many houses, and I just happened to look off to the right, and there was a ranch house with a for sale sign. And I thought, you know, if I were one of those people, and I, I was so bored, I'd begin to make up stories about what goes on there. And so I made up a story about the hand in the window where one of the men does, while he's on duty holding the sign one day, and he's bored, looks over to an abandoned for sale house, and he sees a hand in the window. <laughs> His name is Jay, and now he's, it's happened twice. Jay did not want to admit it, but he had been thinking of driving by the brick house tonight to see if Vic's surveillance was in place. Vic's his brother-in-law, a policeman, and he's explained to Vic that he did really see something, although Vic doesn't trust Jay because Jay was a recovered alcoholic. Now that he and Tim, that's his, Jay's son, he's estranged from his wife, now that he and Tim were going for ice cream, he could make a short detour. 
Ken, would you like to see where I work? There's lots of neat equipment there. Sure, Ken answered enthusiastically. We started trenching here, he pointed out to his son as they turned on the Frog Run Road. Do you run any of the big diggers, Ken asked curiously. Not yet, but I will, and when I do, it's really important for safety, and I handle the traffic flow. You know, stopping the cars when we have only one lane that can be driven on and then starting them up again. He hoped this sounded important enough to Tim. When they got to where the diggers and the trenches were parked, Jay pulled into a field, and they got out, so Tim could look at the equipment. They spent 10 minutes with Jay explaining what each machine did and describing how they all worked together. Finally, he said, look, it's almost dark, and I want to drive up to the end of the road. I'll show you where I sit and eat my lunch. Then we'll get ice cream and get you home. Well, they see something in the, in the uh, ahead of them, and it looks like the flames of a fire. Tim suddenly sat up taller beside them. Look, Dad, there are flames coming from that house. Tim strained against his seatbelt and pointed across his father's chest. Jay rammed on the brakes and stared at the brick house. He didn't see anything in the driveway, no car, no truck, but he clearly saw tongues of fire leaping up from the middle window. He shoved his foot onto the accelerator and took the turn into the driveway as fast as he could. Tim, you stay in the van. Do not come inside. You hear me? He yelled at his son, who would start when only said, yes, Dad, as Jay hit the emergency brake, turned off the engine, and jumped out of the van. He ran to the door. It was locked. The windows were too high to climb through, even if he could break them. He ran frantically around to the back of the house. Near the back porch lay some two-by-four planks, and under the porch he saw the top of a ladder. It was small, wooden, and old, and he did not know if the boards were rotten, but he had to try. He picked it up and ran back to the front yard. Tim was out of the truck and dragging the old iron jack from the back of the van toward the middle window. Here, Dad, you can break the window with this, he shouted as his father came around the side of the house. Jay didn't have time to worry about Tim's being out of the van. He put the ladder in place and grabbed the jack from his son's hands. He climbed up two steps up the ladder. Stand back, he said to Tim, who moved but not far. Jay heaved the jack at the window and it broke. The heat poured out and he knew he could not get in safely. Tim, look for a hose, he said, and he saw Tim run to the side of the house. Jay grabbed the ladder and moved it to the window where he had seen the hand. Again he climbed, and again he heaved the heavy jack against the window. This time the glass fractured in two places, but did not break. What if someone is in there, right under this window, and the glass cuts him, Jay thought, but he had no other choice. He reached back with the jack and threw it with all his weight against the window. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Tim running back with the nozzle with a hose in his hand. Water was streaming from the nozzle. Aim for the flames, he shouted at his son who was already positioning himself under the middle window and aiming up the hose up. The window in front of Jay shattered completely on Jay's second try. He dropped the jack. He knew he couldn't climb through the broken glass safely. He tore off his shirt and placed it over the bottom of the window frame, where fortunately most of the glass had fallen away. He did not know how far the drop was to the floor below, but he had to risk it. He took a deep breath and dropped down. There was no light in the room. It took Jay a few seconds to see anything. When he could see, he made out a cot at the far end, what looked like a small table next to some box-like structure, and in the corner, a small figure crouching against the wall. Jay ran to the child, or whatever it was. The figure was curled up with its head down on one hand, which was hugging its knees. The other hand seemed to be behind its back. Its feet were bare. Jay, then Jay realized some kind of tether around the left hand and back and was hooked to a metal bar high up on the wall. Jay touched the small head with the short black hair. It's all right. I'm the one who wrote you the note. The house is on fire. You've got to come with me now. He had posted a post-it note on the window the day before to say, if you see, if you see this and you're in trouble, wait. And that was the second time he saw the hand. Anyway, I, I won't go on there, but it is a little boy. In the book, a character who happens to be a retired black uh, gallery owner, Zora, Zora Erickson, who appeared in the first book you see him now. I like Zora so much I brought her back. <laughs> uh, she, she's the one who finds the solace in the mystery and kind of gave up, which I'm certainly not going to tell you how it turns out. But she starts going back to people that she feels guilty after 10 years that nobody's ever done anything about this. 
And so she feels guilty about it and she is retired, she's a widow, she takes up the cause. So now she's gotten as far as Florida and she's going to interview the former wife of the broker because some of this does adhere a little bit to real life. And the, the broker's wife's name is Parch. And Zora had gotten in the house by pretending that she's from the hospital where Mrs. Parch does some coding, and of course she isn't. Zora took a deep breath and sat forward. Mrs. Parch, I'm not from the hospital. I should have explained that to you outside. My name is Zora Erickson. I'm from Boston. I'm here because I'm looking for someone, and I think you might be able to help me. You came all the way from Boston. Is it someone I know? I'm not sure. I want to apologize for not writing you or calling first. I really wasn't sure you wanted to talk to me. The person I'm looking for is probably dead, but she was a very close friend of mine. After all these years, I realized that it is not right that no one knows what happened to her. Her name was Jane Hubbard. Zora watched my Maya, that's Mrs. Parch, closely. She saw a slight frown on the younger woman's brow, but nothing more. Silence. Zora waited. I knew her, yes. What is it you want from me? The words sounded emotionless. Well, you know she went missing then. You know they never found her. I read what the judge said at your husband, sorry, your ex-husband's sentencing. I'm not accusing him, Mrs. Parch, but I have the feeling someone who was involved with Jane must know something. Perhaps something they forgot to tell the police years ago. Perhaps something that seems irrelevant. She paused and looked closely at Maya. Did you ever meet Jane? Maya stood up. I'm going to get water. May I bring you a glass? That would be nice. Yes, Laura answered quickly. Was this an excuse for Maya to think up some story? In less than a minute, she reappeared with two cut crystal glasses, water with ice cubes. She put one down on a poster in front of Zora, but remained standing. She took a sip from her own glass and glanced toward her desk as if searching for something. I knew her, yes. We invited her to our house more than once. She had dinner with us. I thought she was a family friend. Maya put her own glass on the coffee table between them. She glanced around the room as if expecting to see someone else. Then she turned back to Zora. I may have been wrong. I've wondered about that for many years. I have thought that perhaps she was only his friend. Do you mean you think your husband and Jane were having an affair? Zora hated asking this of someone who had probably suffered an awful doubt for so long, but she was here to help Jane, not Maya Parch. Maya sat down arranging her skirts and no wrinkles showed. He had other women. That's why I divorced him, you know. It wasn't just because of the money, because of what they accused him of, of defrauding those women. It was because he lied to me. I'm really sorry to cause you pain in bringing all this up, Zora said, wishing she could reach out with a gesture of sympathy, but this was not the time. Did you ever have any idea that your husband was afraid of Jane or how she might testify against him? Maya moved to the water glass. No, I never heard him say anything like that. After he got away with taking money from that woman in Colorado, I expect he thought he could get away with anything. When your friend disappeared, he seemed upset, but maybe that was an act. I don't know. After all this time, I don't know. Well, Maya becomes one of the suspects, needless to say.